Jesus, go ahead and give God a clap offering this yes, morning. Lord. How are we feeling out there? How's everybody doing? How's everybody's week been? So if there's anything that I was reminded of this morning, it was just to keep it simple, right? When we come to the house of the Lord is our opportunity to just be one-on-one -on -one with God. Just to give him anything that we've been going through of the week, any praise, any trials, any tribulation. But the good thing about God is he's always the same, yesterday, today, and forever. So with that being said, church, just be encouraged. No matter what you be going through, Jesus is right there with you. Amen? So let me just open us up with a word of prayer before we do praise and worship. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just ask you, Lord, to meet us right where we are, Lord. Whatever we may be going through, Lord, throughout the week, it is our opportunity to sit right here at your feet, Lord, and just bask in your presence, Lord. We give you all honor, all praise, and all glory in everything, Jesus. In your mighty name we pray, amen. It's all 
about you. It's all about you. It's all about you. It's all about Jesus. 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 Ooh, hallelujah. It's all about you. Church.
thank you, Lord, for the breath of life. We thank you, Lord, for waking us up this morning. We thank you, Lord, for our pastors and just for your word, Lord, that we we need to live out there, Father God, that guides us through this life. I ask that you please bless this service, bless your people, bless the word that's about to come. And we ask for all these things in Jesus' name. All right, all right, all right. While you're on your feet, won't you find about 25 people? High five them and tell them it's great to be in the house of the Lord today, amen? Well, I'm back from pastor's obedience school, and I can tell y'all I'm still disobedient. <laughs> it's good to be back in the house of the Lord. I tell you, I miss every last one of you, but I needed that break. Amen. I understand last week was outstanding. All of the CEOs came out. That is always a good thing. When the CEOs come out, Pastor Joe came in from a, a trip and, and jumped right into the pulpit and he, he preached a wonderful message on our living hope. How many of us know in the world that we live in, we need a living hope? If you don't, then you're in the wrong place. I'm going to tell you that now. You can look out and see all kinds of crazy things. His, his, his text came from 1 Peter um, chapter 1, verse 3 to 5. It says, Blessed be to God. To the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for, for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be renewed in the last time. And then he got three observations from that text. We are born again to a living hope. We got to realize that. How many of us understand that we are born again? If we give our life to Jesus Christ, then we are born again. That is a must. I mean, that is a thing. And then I know he, he used a, a, a scripture that I was about to use today, but I'm glad I read over and looked at it, heard his uh, message because it was but Nicodemus. John chapter 3, verses 3 to 4. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. I think I need to say that again. Unless one is born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus was speaking about spiritual rebirth, right? And so he was telling them, you got to be born again. That's not a physical thing. That's a spiritual thing. And that's what he was saying. That's what he's saying to each and every last one of them. And as I was studying for the message this week, I began to realize that we are so tied up in religiosity that we are missing our walk with God. So many rules, regulations, and rituals that we're trying to follow that we don't even follow the word of God. His second point was our inheritance is untarnishable. Nobody can touch our inheritance. You can lose it yourself, but nobody can't take it from you. Our salvation is safeguarded by God, period. God did all of the work. Why did he do all the work? Because he loved you and I. The salvation of our soul, he gives those three points. Justification out of Romans 5.1. Sanctification out of Philippians 2, 12-13. And glorification, 1 John 3.2. And then he concluded up the message. That was a powerful message 
for an Easter day and a reminder to us what that day is all about. It's not about you. It's not about the Easter bunny. It's not about all of the crazy things that people get out and do. It's about the fact that God so loved the world that he bankrupt heaven so that you and I can be redeemed. That's the love that God possess for each and every last one of us. Let's, if you enjoyed that message, let's give Pastor Joe a hand for having such a wonderful message. Now you may be looking around and say, Pastor, where is everybody at? You're here. And we're going to cut up with you being here. That's it. If, it's, you know, if, if they needed to be here, then they'll be here. Everybody needs to be in God's house. Whatever choice they make, that's on them. So please stand for the reading of God's word. I ain't preaching. God knows about six years. I'm going to have fun now. <laughs> Title of this message is the benefits of believing in Jesus. And we'll conclude in Matthew chapter 11, 25 to 30. And it reads, at that time, Jesus prayed this prayer. O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things for those who think of themselves wise and clever and for revealing them to the childlike. Yes, Father, it pleased you to do it this way. My Father has entrusted everything to me. No one truly knows the Son except the Father, and no one truly knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then Jesus said, Come to me, all who are weary, and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle hearted and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. This is the reading of God's word. Please have your seats. So we're concluding chapter 11, still in the same series, Life Conflicts. But we're concluding chapter 11. And I think that's good because, you know, we started off with chapter 11 and we ended up with doubt right off the bat. Right. But you're going to see that Jesus is going to close this up in a different note. Intro says chapter 11 started with doubt of John the Baptist and Jesus addressing John's disciples and the surrounding crowds. We've had the following messages. Stay the course. Confronting questions and doubt. Matthew chapter 11, 1 through 6. Stand for truth, speaking up for John the Baptist. J.C. standing up for J.B. Matthew 11, chapter 7 to 15. Pride in the fall, curse of the heart in heart. Matthew 11, 16 to 24. And we close out the chapter, as we close out the chapter, we see Jesus providing benefits to those who, who believe in him. Pastor, why are you telling us that? There is a key to that. For those who believe in him. Remember I started off earlier telling us that we didn't got so wrapped up in religion that we didn't lost sight on what's real. See, religion is man-made rules, rituals and regulations of what they feel like you should do, how you should live, what you should say, how you should dress, who you should speak to. But God didn't call us to a religion. He called us to a personal relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. And when Jesus came, they asked which were the greatest commandments because that was the other thing that the, the religious people do. They hold you to your the feet to the fire with those, all of those rules and the laws. And Jesus says the greatest of them all is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. And the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. What is he saying? Love. Because if you can learn to love God's way, everything else will fall in place. And that's what Jesus is saying. That's what he was telling us. So I'm not going to keep you long, but I'm going to tell you the truth. Two observations from this text. The great reveal and the promise of rest. 
the great reveal and the promise of rest. The great reveal got two parts. Part one. At the time, at that time, Jesus prayed this prayer. When he said that Jesus prayed this prayer, he prayed it out aloud. He didn't say, I'm going to pray. Amen. No, he prayed it out aloud because he wanted everybody to hear what he was saying and what was going on. And here's what he said. Oh, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever. See, it's all them smart people. You think you got all of the answers. You're unteachable. You can't sit under authority. You can't listen to what the word says. You don't even read the word because you think you have all the answers. And this was the people that Jesus was talking about, the religious rulers, the Pharisees, the leaders. And I'm afraid to say even some of us today, right? He says, and for revealing them to the childlike. Who are the childlike? They're the humble. They're the people that realize who Jesus is and are sitting under, at his feet willing to be taught what the heavens says need to be taught. We need to be childlike. We need to humble ourselves. I don't care how old you are. You're a child in God. And that means we need to humble ourselves and leave ourselves open to be taught the trueness of God's word. Not somebody putting scriptures together to manipulate and motivate you, but the trueness of God's word. And if it makes you say, ouch, that's just because you're in violation of it. Clean it up and you won't have to say, ouch, again. That's easy for you to say, Pastor, you just don't know this demon that's sitting up there. I had to learn that for myself. But I had to learn it after I came out the legalistic way of thinking. Because in my own way, in my own day, I was like the Pharisees. When I gave my life to the Lord and I started moving through ministry and started looking at all of the crazy things that it was requiring you to do and say and be and act, I found myself being that same way. If somebody was living outside of the word of God, I would frown on them. I wanted to judge them. I was taking on God's place for myself. It was so bad that my we, we, we was at a church and we was invited to a wedding. And after the wedding, we went to the ceremony. And I seen people kept bending down and getting up and bending down and getting up. And I'm like, what is wrong with these people? But they had alcohol at the wedding. And because the Pharisee was sitting up in there, they didn't want me to see them drinking. And right then the light bulb came on. Do I cast such a legalistic shadow over people that they're afraid to live their life? How can I witness to them when they don't seem like I can even relate to them? Right? I was stunned. I was really stunned. But that's what happens to us. Jesus said he wants us to be childlike. He wants us to be humble. He wants us to remember that we are all sinners saved by his grace. Right? And that's what he wanted us to understand. Matthew chapter 18 verse 1 to 4 says, About that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child to him. And put the child among them. Then he said, I tell you the truth. Unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. See, children are innocent. Children, are just, they just they want to be taught. They just they want to have fun. They just want to learn. And then they grow up. And you'd be looking at them like, where did you come from and how can I send you back? <laughs> That's us. 
And we find it hard that we can't witness to people where, where, where we come from is because we go there with a Pharisee legalistic way of thinking. We want to judge people before we love them. Love them. Let God judge them. Point them to God. Show them how to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I guarantee you, that will change them. How do you know, Pastor? Because of that same thing. You calling me Pastor. He changed me. And if he changed me, I know that he can change each and every last one of you as well. Right? 1 John chapter 5, verse 1 through 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has become a child of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his children too. Here's the key. We know we love God's children if we love God and obey his commandments. Loving God means keeping his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For every child of God defeats this evil world. For every child of God defeats this evil world. And we achieve this victory through our faith. And who can win this battle against the world? Only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. See, it is not about a religion. And that's the thing that scares me because I talk to a lot of people, especially church people, and they do things because I love my church. Great. I don't want to disappoint my pastor. Great. But my faith. Great. The one thing I never hear anybody says is I always want to be good with Jesus. Colossians 3.23 says do everything that you do. Everything. As though you're doing it unto God and not man. See, when we're good with God, then we're good. If man's got a problem, he's got a problem with God. Yeah. It's good to love your pastor. I don't think that there's not a person up in here other than his immediate family can love Joe Onasai the way Carlos Cambry does. And how? Because I serve the church. But I can love him because I first love God Almighty. And everything that I do, I don't do it for his approval. I do it for God's approval. That's it. So if God is happy and Pastor Joe is mad, then God's going to deal with Pastor Joe, not me. I'm good, right? That's it. But here's the deal. When you're doing what God has called you to do, and if the man of God is doing what God has called him to do, you don't have to worry about those things. You're always going to be good. Amen? Amen. Jesus is saying that God reveals the truth of the kingdom to those who have, a, who have the humility and openness to receive it and who are willing to follow Jesus in faith. These are the little children that Jesus is speaking of. They're the ones who are willing to learn from Jesus, to trust in his teachings, and to follow him as their Lord and Savior. The second part to that, God reveals, my father has entrusted everything to me. No one truly knows the son except the father. And no one truly knows the father except the son. And those to whom the son choose to reveal him. You cannot know God if you ignore Jesus. You cannot know Jesus if you deny God. The two are one. God the Father, God the Son. And if you and I want to know who God is, know the Son. Why is that so important? For God so loved the world that he sent his Son. Who is his Son? Him in human form. To live out life, to walk out life with us. To build a personal relationship. Not to be bogged down by laws, rituals, and rules, but to have a personal, loving relationship. To be humble. To understand that it's by God's grace and God's mercy that we are free. And so when we begin to walk out life that way, we find 
that it is pleasurable and not burdensome. As a result of that, we want to follow God's rules, period. We live according to God's word. John chapter 10 verse 30 says, the father and I are one. So here's the deal. Here's this other thing I hear from a lot of people. Well, you know, I pray in his name. I look up to him. Who is him? It's in the name of Jesus. Him is Jesus. If you can't say his name, you're not praying to him. You're not doing things in his name. Right? Don't be afraid to say the name of Jesus. And if the world is upset because you say the name of Jesus, do what I would do. Jesus, 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 Jesus. <laughs> now you're mad. I'm good. Be mad. Right? This is the turning point that made all of the Pharisees and all the other religious nuts certain that they were going to do everything they could to get rid of Jesus. When he said, I and the Father are one, they didn't believe in Jesus. And now they're saying, oh, he, he's saying that he God. Uh, he got to go. That fool got to go. John chapter 14, verse 6 and 7, and then again in 13 and 14. 6 and 7 says, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. For now on, you do, you do know me, and you have seen him. So he's saying, if you didn't see me, you've seen the Father. But you can't get to God without coming through me. Right? You got to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ if you expect to get to heaven and get to the Father. And we need to dig down into that and to really understand it's not about religion. It's not about your faith. It's about your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That builds everything else from there. Amen? Here's the key, though. 13, 14 says, you can ask anything in my name. What's that name? Jesus. And I will do it. So that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me anything in my name and I will do it. So here's a question for you. Are you humble and childlike? Or are you one of those legalistic Pharisees nuts that hold people by regulation rules and all the rest of these things? And I want you to think of this here because many of us grew up in church but we grew up under religion. And we never develop a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And the religion said, you can't do this, you can't do that. You can't look this way, you can't look that way. You gotta speak this way, you can't do this. You can't raise your hand, you can't shout. These, these instruments, them are devil people, you can't do those. That, Jesus didn't say those things. He said, come to me. Build a relationship with me. And not only say you come to me and build a relationship to, with me, look at this. He came to us. Why? To build a personal relationship with each and every last one of us. So that's the change. That's the big mark. The second point, the promise of rest. Then Jesus said, come to me all who are weary and carry heavy burdens and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest in your souls. For my, my yoke is easy to bear and my burden and the burden I give you is light, right? Now, this is a two part thing. Two key things. Jesus said first, look at what he says. He says, 
take my yoke. You have to take from God. He says, take my yoke, right? And the yoke is the thing that binds things together. He's using to bind big oxes, and some of them were really heavy. But some really good carpenters, really good craftsmen, was able to build some yokes that were really light, very fitting, didn't cause harm, but got the job done. Jesus was a carpenter. Who do you think was the master at building that yoke that wasn't burdensome, that was form-fitting, that was easy to wear, but that connected you to him on a permanent basis? He says, you take my yoke. Here it is. I'm giving it to you. Take my yoke. But then he says, let me teach you. So you got to ask yourself, are you teachable? Because if you're teachable, you're reachable. But if nobody can teach you, they can't reach you. Right? He says, let me teach you. What is he going to teach you? First of all, I'm going to unlearn all of those crazy things that I learned. And then I'm going to learn the new things of doing it God's way. You know, when I was a drill sergeant, we used to teach basic rifle marksmanship. And I, I loved when that time came, and I hated when that time came. I loved when that time came because you get to teach people something unique and phenomenal. But I hated when that time came because I had all of those that grew up with weapons. The hunters, the gangbangers, the hunters thought they were Daniel Boone. <laughs> and then you had the gangbangers. I got them, I got them. <laughs> and to reteach them was more difficult than it was to take those that had never touched a weapon before and teach them the proper fundamentals. And sometimes that is the burden of the pastor. You got people that grew up in religious rules and laws and different things. And then they come to a church that are teaching God's word. And to get them to unlearn all of these things that they had formed in their head, to learn it, to do it God's way, becomes an issue. Because we say, well, we're not learning and growing. Are you teachable? We're not getting anything from the word. Are you humble and listening? Well, they're only preaching on this one thing. Because we follow in the word, line upon line, precept upon precept. That's how you learn God's word. You don't learn God's word by jumping from Genesis to Revelation to, to Matthew to Moses and then back across. No, you learn it by going one whole chapter, one whole book at a time so you can learn what God is saying, how he is saying it, and what it truly, truly means. Right? We're learning God's word. Matthew chapter 23, verse 1 to 4. Now, when Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and carry heavy burden. You know what that heavy burden is? Religion! All you religious people? If a woman don't come to church with a dress on, then she just, she ain't living God's world. Who said that? If you come to church with shorts on, then you say, who said that? See, religion got all of these crazy rules. And then we point it to God. And we say it's his fault. God didn't create that. We did. Man did. Right? Look at what Matthew says. He was talking about the Pharisees. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. So practice and obey whatever they tell you, but don't follow their example. For they don't practice what they, pre what they teach. They crush people with the unbearable 
religious demands and never lift a finger to ease the burden. Right? When Jesus invites those, when Jesus invites those who are burdened and weary to come to him to find rest, he is offering them the solution to their spiritual and emotional exhaustion. The burden and weariness that he speaks of could be caused by a variety of things such as sin, guilt, fear, anxiety, a physical illness. Jesus said, come to me. Take my yoke, but let me teach you, right? And I find myself sometimes in a difficult spot. And I'm wondering why I'm so heavy hearted. And Jesus says, because you don't have my yoke. You're carrying the yoke of the world. It's heavy. But I'll trade with you. I'll give you mine. You give me yours. You'll find rest in your soul. And son, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I got your back, right? That's what Jesus is telling us. Acts chapter 15, verse 6 to 11. And this was Peter talking as they went to the Gentiles and it was ministering to them. So the apostles and the elders met together to resolve this issue because they wanted the Gentiles to be circumcised the way the Jews were. At the meeting, after a long discussion, Peter stood and addressed them as, as, as follows. Brothers, you know, you all know that God chose me from among you some time ago to preach to the Gentiles so that they could hear the good news and believe. God knows people's hearts and he confirmed that he accepts the Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did with us. He made no distinction between us and them. For, his, for he cleansed their hearts through faith. So why are you now challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear? We believe that we are all saved the same way by the undeserved grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So my question to you, are you teachable in the things of Jesus? Do you require people to jump through hoops the way others required you to jump through, even if the Bible doesn't say so? Are you teachable? Because if you're teachable, you're reachable. Amen? Closing this up. Jesus is the only one who can provide redemption and relief to those who not only believe in him, but are totally committed to being his disciples. In short, this is about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, not a religion. If we, humble, if we are humble, childlike, and teachable, Jesus will reveal the hidden things to us. Jesus also promises to provide rest to those who take his yoke, which is not burdensome nor heavy. So my last question for you is this. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Or are you stuck on a heavy burden religion with lots of rules, rituals, and regulations? With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want you to think of that. And if you're sitting right here right now and you say, Pastor, I don't have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All my life, I've just been following the religion. I want to take that yoke. I want to be teached. I need that, Pastor. I heard everything that you said, and I just want to walk with Jesus. I want to learn from Jesus. I want to be loved by Jesus. And I want to learn to love the way Jesus says to do so. If that's you, kindly slip your hands in the air because we just want to pray for you. We want to acknowledge you. 
Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see those hands. Thank you. Father, we thank you for everybody that raised their hand. And I thank you, Lord, that each and every last one of them develop a personal relationship with you. One that's not burdensome. One that the yoke is easy. But Father, that they remain teachable so that you can continue to pour into their humble, childlike hearts. And Father, I thank you for the rest of the church, everybody. Father, that we come to you so that we can find true rest. True rest for our souls. And remain humble-hearted throughout our lifetime. Thank you for all of these things in the mighty and the powerful name of Jesus. The church in agreement, say. Amen. Let's give Pastor Carlos a hand. What are the benefits of following Christ? There are so many, and I don't want to take up Pastor Joe's time because he's coming after me with a, with a closing, but it is offering time right now, and that's one of the benefits. <laughs> that's one of the benefits of being a child of God, following Jesus. He is a provider. He is a provider for everything that we need. Money, clothing, housing, everything. But I'm asking you this question, who is your master? God or money? Before I get further into this, we have our offering opportunities on the screen. You can push, use push pay Envelopes, if you need an envelope, raise your hand. The ushers will hand you one. Cash, checks, whatever you have, it all comes from God, and you're giving back to him. So I'm asking this question again. Who is your master, God or money? Matthew 6.24 says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Well, okay, well then why do I have money? See, giving is a choice. It doesn't mean that we are not to use money, but it means that we are to use money for God's purposes. So that's why you're giving. You give to put back into, first of all, you're telling God, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for providing everything that you, that me my family everything that we have the food on our tables today thank you is purchased with money that God provided for you to earn so the best thing that you can do right now is to give back well pastor how, how do I start that start somewhere it could be a dollar it could be five it could be ten and maybe you are like okay well I'm ready to just go all in that means tithing 10%. But start somewhere. We cannot serve mon God and money, but we can serve God with our money. So let's do that today. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for what you have provided for us. We only want to bless you, Lord, with what you have already blessed us with. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this opportunity to give into your kingdom and to bless others with it, Lord God. So take this money, do with it what you have, what you see best to do with it, Lord. In the precious and mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Here's Pastor Joan. Amen. Let's give it up for Pastor Vanessa. In fact, I'm going to ask Pastor Carlos Vanessa to come up and my wife come up. You know, I don't know about you, but I so appreciate uh, that message. And most of all, you know, being that he was gone for two Sundays which is rarely ever happens. Um, I, I miss uh, Rough Rider 7's commanding voice. Come on, somebody. Me. I, I just love his approach of uh, no nonsense, black and white, just straight up word. And, 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 and it's just the authority that he speaks with really always ministers to my soul. Um, you know, last week, Sunday, we celebrated Easter. Uh, the Resurrection Sunday, and the day after that was actually our 12th 
anniversary. And so we were actually contemplating whether to do it, you know, together with Easter. And he was like, no, nah, we, we can't let Resurrection Sunday, they, that has to stand alone to honor God. But it is our 12th anniversary. And so I just wanted to, to say this, uh, to say a few words. And maybe Pastor Carlos, Vanessa, and my wife, uh, just to say a few words as well. Thank you for being an amazing church. Okay. Thank yourselves. Come on. That's just Thank you, sir. Thank you for being an amazing church. We, we, I, I really believe that we're only scratching the surface of what God has in store for our church. I believe that uh, 12 years is a foundational time where God has been building our foundation. But I really believe that that foundation now, we're going to build on that foundation. We're going to continue to build and see the amazing thing that God has in store for us. So. He's putting me on the spot here. Just because I had a closed service when everybody was gone. <laughs> no, we are truly, truly appreciative of every, every single one of you and um, what you've sown into this church. We couldn't do it without all of you. So thank you so much. And we look forward to continuing on. Amen. Wow. And he put, look, this one here. <laughs> wow. <laughs> We want to just say thank you, guys. It's been a wonderful 12 years, and it's going to be another wonderful 12, 13, 14, 50 more. <laughs> thank you, guys. We just love you all, and we cannot do this without you. So give your hand, yourselves a hand for that. <laughs> well, I don't know what else to say except for this. My name is Carlos Cambry, and I get to be the executive pastor to the greatest church in America. And I mean that with all of my heart. I do. This is the greatest church. We got pastors that love us, and we got people that love God. And you, when you got a, that combination, you can't go wrong. Love God, serve people each and every day. I am so proud to be a member of Destiny Christian Church. And I look forward to not only the next 12, but the next 50 years and beyond to see what God Almighty is doing in destiny. Amen. So give yourself one big hand one more time as a result. So, Father, I'm so grateful, Lord God. What makes the church is the people in the church. Father, I'm so grateful for those that, Lord God, have linked arms with us and the good times and the bad times have stuck with us, Lord God, and continue to serve you. Father, I thank you so much, Father God, for those that volunteer week in and week out, give up their abilities and their talents to advance your kingdom. Father, I thank you, Lord God, that you would continue, Father, to, as they have continued to water the fields of this church, that you would water the fields of their lives. Father, continue to bless them, continue to pour out, Father God, Strengthen them, Lord God. I pray for health. I pray, Father, for your prosperity upon their lives. We just continue to thank you, Lord God. That your face will continue to shine upon them, upon their families, upon their children, upon their jobs, upon their businesses, upon their health. So, Lord, we release this blessing upon them. And we're so grateful again for the 12 years that you've given us. And we look forward to the greater things that you have in store. We love you, Lord God. We thank you for your blessing in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. We got some cupcakes and, and things that will make you fat downstairs. Okay, bye-bye.